All right, we are live with the Short Term Rental Pro podcast. I'm super excited today to be joined by Brian Bockholt, who is not only a short term rental investor himself, who's actually live from one of his properties right now, but he's also a financer, having done how many, how many properties have you financed for clients in your days, Brian? Oh boy. Well, the dollar amounts definitely over a billion. I know that. Oh my so, goodness. Quite a few. But thousands, probably thousands of different properties oh, for, for sure. investors. No doubt. That's definitely in the thousands. Yeah. Brian is one of the leaders in the game for short-term rental financing. And he's also has his own amazing portfolio. So Brian, how did you get started in short-term rentals? Kind of by accident. I think maybe that's the way it happened for a lot of people. We made a lake house purchase in 2021, 2020 rather, a COVID, I would call it a COVID purchase about an hour from our house with not really any intention necessarily to rent it. But we had some friends that had done something similar and they rented it a little bit and we got in it about as ignorant as that, just renting our lake house out here and there in the beginning. And then months later, our first vacation here to Marco Island, it was supposed to just be a vacation and we left under contract actually in on the condo that I'm standing in now. And with the two properties, I was given a mandate by my wife that we had to rent them like heck to try to make some money back. And the rest is history. We've since bought a couple more properties down here. We're building another one. And uh, that's kind of all transpired in the last uh, two and a half years or so. So, so where are you from and where was this first property you bought in 2021? We live just a little bit south of Chicago and we bought a lake house was about an hour north from our primary residence. And how much, if you don't mind me asking, how much did you buy it for? The lake house, 595,000. Okay. 595. And is it still kind of like a, cause it seems like a lot of your, I mean, you're currently in one of your properties in where Mar Marco, Marco's Island in Florida. Mar Marco Island. Yep. Do you go to all four of your own properties? Is that? Pretty, pretty regular regularness. Yeah. Since we didn't get into this with the business as the original design, personal use has always been a huge component for us, no doubt. We're certainly way more business oriented now in this space than we were in the beginning when we first bought the lake house. But yes, we use all of our properties. So would you call it, would you consider it a lifestyle asset? Most definitely. Got it. Exactly okay. So, it you, so you got in first one, 2021. You started renting it out. Were you kind of like personally surprised on how well it was doing? And then did that inspire you to then add the additional properties to your portfolio? We were extremely surprised actually with how much we were able to get for the lake house to the point where it was a constant battle of wanting to use it for personal uh -huh. and realizing how much money we were sacrificing on a week in July if we did that. And still to this day, we have to find that balance, but we were very surprised for sure. What would a week in July be? put in your pocket? About seven grand. Wow. So seven about, grand. Or about a thousand a night in the summer. A G a night. So what is, what do you, what is this property grossing on an annual, annual basis? Well, this property doesn't gross a ton because this is still the one, the one of the bunch that we do use being so close to our private. Got it. We do still sacrifice a ton of money in the summer and use it for personal use quite a bit, but we, it pays for itself. And then a little something on top of that, while us getting an absolute ton of personal use, we only do six or seven runners in the summer. And then we run it over the winter. Obviously the demand is much lower, but uh, yeah, I mean, it literally pays for itself. That's for, good. That was six to eight runners. That's so, wow. That is a dream. Six to eight renters a year for about a, what a week apiece pays for the entire mortgage, entire expenses repairs for a lake house property. So got the first one, you were surprised by how it was doing. And then you decided to buy additional properties, ones that you wouldn't go to as often. Where are those properties? When did you get them? How much did you get them for? And how are they doing? Well, so the next one was in Marco Island, which is where all of the remaining ones are. And that was the condo that I'm standing in. Now we closed on that February of 2021. The lake house was actually July of 2020. That was the first one. This one was, we closed February of 2021, bought it for 695,000 worth every bit of 1.2 million. Now we wow. didn't do a single thing to it. That's just a, that's just how crazy the market got right after we purchased. We thought we were purchasing high 
because even at the 695, they had jumped quite a bit. You always do. You always six months. You always think you're purchasing high and then six mm -hmm. months later, oh, we, exactly. we got a good deal. So uh, this one does really well. Um, obviously we got into the good purchase price and a good interest rate and it probably does about 150,000. Very solid. And then what about the, when did you add the additional condos? So we bought a house here on Marco seven or eight months later, would have been October of 2021. And we bought that for 940,000. That one's going to do about the same. It's a little more expensive than the condo, but it will do about 150 as well. And then we bought another condo in January of last year for 500,000, just a little one bedroom. And we also bought a piece of land recently uh, in December, and then we're getting ready to build a uh, five bed, five and a half bath, 4,200 square foot house on. That has got a crush. So we'll that'll be that. a 4.2 million valuation, at least currently today's current market. And we're going to rent that for a while and see how that goes, but it'll be a monster. All right. I want to get into, I want to unpack that because I'm personally curious. Well, I've never built anything. I have, I've only, I've renovated, I've added finished square footage, but I've never actually built anything. So I am curious, and I, this is going to tie into kind of the financing aspect, guys. Brian, his day job, so to speak, is, yeah, tell us what is your day job? And in the last couple of years, how has your business kind of shifted to largely working with short-term rental investors like yourself? Yeah. Well, my day job is mortgage lending. I'm a mortgage loan officer. I have been since I turned 18. I'm 48 now, so that makes 30 years. Long wow. Time. <laughs> three um, decades. Yeah, three decades. When we first just started, when we, by the time we bought our second short-term rental or so, we started to get in circles and meet and talk to people like yourself and other people doing the, S in the STR game. And the, just my business personally, which was always just standard primary resident stuff 95% of the time. The synergy with the clients, the like-minded clients that are looking to buy STR has just really blossomed. And I would say now probably 80 plus to me approaching 90% of my business is STR, STR clients. So second home so loan, in, investors, property loans. Largely investors. Okay. And what, and tell us, so these first, so you've done you yourself, and obviously we can talk about for clients what you've done, but you've done you, those four properties you bought, did you get a loan for each of them? We did. Yeah. And what type of, if you don't mind me asking, what financing sure. did you do for yourself? And then also what I want to then tie that into is like, what loans do you recommend for your investors? Well, so I was able to do something pretty cool here in Marco that it's not an easy thing to do. And I, which is buy multiple in the same market without having to ever once use an investment property loan. Investment property loans are a great tool, but you're going to have a higher down payment requirement, which for most of the people doing this, the, they want to get in for as little money as they can, because for a lot of people, for most people, the plan is to scale and they want to have hold on to as much capital, of course, as they can, so they can scale quicker. We bought the first condo, the one I'm in now here for, we did a 10% down second home loan. And then eight months later, about eight months later, we bought the house and we did, that was a jumbo. So we did 15% down and that, but we were able to do another second home loan just down the street only, uh, about eight months later. The reason was there is some nuance to that rule. You can't typically do that, but since we were buying a completely different kind of property, we were buying, we were going from a condo to a single family, we were, so able were up upgrading to, properties. We were, so we're basically able to then tell the underwriter the story that, you know, we, we love Marco Island. We love our condo, but we've decided with the time we spent down here, we would prefer a single family home with a private pool versus condo life. So yeah, we, and, but, that's what I've been told before. Cause I've, I've done second home loans and then I tried to do second home loans again in the same market mm -hmm. and the way. At least I've been told the way it has to be like a, yeah, an upgrade to like a different type of property. Mm -hmm. That is the way. Cause then, oh, I had this one for six months, but now I'm leveling up and mm -hmm. the requirements are okay with that. For the most part, that's correct. It, a lot of things go into it. How long ago did you buy the first one? Did you buy it two months ago and you've already decided you want something completely different? That might be a little harder story to tell. <laughs> 
And it doesn't necessarily even have to be upgraded. It could be you bought a four bedroom and you decided you don't need a four bedroom. You bought, now you want to buy a two. Downsize. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you need something entirely different. All right. So you were able to get multiple second home loans. And I guess a lot of times in like my social media comments, I get, oh, you can't do a second home loan for a quote unquote, like investment property. Unpack Mm -hmm. that for me. Well, there's a, there's a lot of misinformation and just uh, in on that exact subject. A lot of people just don't understand it. When you use a second home loan, it has nothing, does not mean you can't rent your property at all. There's no rules against renting your second home, even renting it a lot. Quite frankly, you can rent your primary residence. I mean, I would never do, but some people do that. And you, there's not any rules mortgage lending wise relating to that either. Um, when you, you use the second home, you can't loan, do it all the time. You can't rent it all the time. So when you're doing a second home loan, it does imply some personal use aspect. The underwriting guideline literally says that the buyer will use the property for personal use some portion of the year, some portion of the year. So what does that even mean? A lot of people say two weeks is the benchmark, but that's not even in written guidelines. It just says some portion of the year. It's also a completely immeasurable, impossible thing to measure. No lender is going to trail you and find out how many days a year you stay at your property. So maybe one year you're there two or three weeks, maybe the next year you're not there for two weeks. That's totally okay. So, and that's what everybody else in this space is doing. You want to use a second home loan because you're going to be able to do something like 10% down. You're probably going to get a little better interest rate than you would if you were to use a investment property loan. Got it. And then for primary, I'm just curious now, what is the, what's the language say for a primary home? Not sure the specific, like I just rattled off for the second home loan, but uh, there is no, there's nothing that prohibits you from running your property. Period. Got so it. if you're a, if you buy like the me, primary, it like my- you intend to live here, you intend for this to be your like main residence, right? Like where if like you, let's say you're under contract on a primary house and you get a, you get like a, you get a lease or somewhere else, like then, then it would be look a little late because then it's like, all right, why are you getting a lease? So or correct me if I'm wrong, but it's really just like you intend for this at this moment, you intend for this to be the place you live. That's exactly the right way to put it too. And intent was the exact right word to use is at the time that you're signing the documents, your intention of that property is primary residence, second home, whatever it might be. That's it. Your life can change quickly, right? You can buy a property as a primary residence and six months later, not need that home anymore or need to move for some other purpose, right? Maybe it's a job change. Maybe it's a life change, like a divorce or, or you suddenly you're pregnant with triplets and the house you just bought six months ago isn't going to work for you anymore. You can go right on and buy something else. And you don't have to turn in your old loan. And some people even think you have to change the loan because it's a primary residence. You absolutely don't have to do anything. And you don't have to tell anybody. Don't have to tell anybody. Nobody's asking. At the time you signed the documents, your intention was to use it as a primary residence. Things change six months later. Nothing can be done about it. Yeah, there's just that. I mean, I'm trying to remember the name of the case, but somebody bought a house. I think they actually bought two houses. They bought one as a primary, one as a secondary. And they had a lease document signed prior to closing from somebody saying that they were going to rent the house from them for a year at a time. Yeah. Then that shows that you clearly don't have the intent to, right. to live there if you've already right. signed a lease document. Yeah, so that would be occupancy fraud. That would be mortgage fraud for sure if you were to do that. But uh, there's still plenty of ambiguity though and things can change, but that would be a no-no for sure. Got it, guys. So don't mess around with any of that. So kind of we're despelling second home loans. You need to, to stay there a certain portion of the year. Or uh, Brian, if I butchered that language, but essentially second homes, they're okay for short term rentals. You can do and what and the Absolutely. advantages are ten percent down versus an investment loan when you have to do what twenty percent down. Well, you can do as little as fifteen percent down, but you really get hammered pricing wise when you do that. So you're a little better off at twenty, and then like some banks with whether it be like their portfolio products and that, they might require even 25% down for investment. So worse terms and more down 
on an investment property. All right, so 10% down for a second home loan, and then what would be an investment loan? 50, starting at 15% down, but you're going to get worse terms, interest rate-wise, and you really get hammered at that 15% down level for an investment property. So you'd be a little better off sometimes to do 20 or 25. So you're looking at a much more significant financial burden on the front end when you use an investment so, property loan. So what I want to do, so a lot of people now are talking about, oh, interest rates. Uh, I want to get into what you're seeing today, like what are the, and then kind of what you would recommend for folks, but let's break it down. Just how crazy on your side was 20, 2021, 2022 from a mortgage, a mortgage standpoint. Pretty historically crazy. <laughs> I mean, rates in the twos. I even did some loans for people, some arms for people as low as 1.7%. So Jeez. that was pretty, it was pretty I crazy. Bet, no I bet they it. wish, I bet they wish they've got a fixed, a fixed rate. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So how many, I guess, how many loans? I'm just curious. How many loans were you like doing a week at that point? We're probably closing 250 units a year. So got it. So about five a plus. week on average. Yeah. Something like that. One every wow. day. That's crazy. So I don't know. Let's assume a half million dollars of purchase price. Multiply mm -hmm. that by 250K. We're at, let's see if I can do quick math out yeah. Hundreds of million, over a hundred, over a hundred million. Yeah. So you did hundred million dollars of loans, 2020, 2021, 2022. I guess. So tell me, what are you seeing in 2023? I mean, invest. I'm personally, you know, I bought a house a month ago. I bought one in October of 2022. Like I'll speak for myself, where I'm still, I'm still, I got my foot on the pedal. But like, what are you Absolutely. seeing from folks? Well. There's still a lot of people in this space buying. I mean, there's no doubt about it. There's a lot of investors on the sidelines for sure, waiting for prices to come down and or rates to come down. And they might be waiting for a while, especially on prices. Not sure that'll even happen. A lot of people predicted that we would have had that big drop in values already. And we haven't. It's kind of stagnated. It's leveled off. Maybe in some areas there's been a slight dip, but it's been slight if it's dipped at all. I know here on Marco, it but flattened, but we haven't gone down in price really at all, if at all. But uh, most of the investors have the mindset. They're just, they're jumping on things like the seven-year arm. They have high confidence that they'll be able to refinance in the next couple of years. Maybe not back down to the twos or threes, but probably the fives. A lot of people even pencil out their numbers that way. I mean, right now you're getting into something maybe in the sevens and you have to make sure that the numbers work at that rate, at that payment. But you should be forecasting as well. What is my payment going to look like if I'm able to refi it down to 5% in a year or two, just to see what that, what those numbers would look like when that time comes. But a lot of people are still got their foot, still have their foot on the gas. The best time to, the answer to the question, in my opinion, when is the best time to buy real estate? The answer is always now. Or a year ago. <laughs> or yeah, before. Well, exactly. It's. The waiting game just does pays off far less often than people that are aggressive and just get in and do it now. Yeah. And I would say the thing with real estate is like with a stock, yeah, you go, you could time it. A stock goes up, it goes down. There's really nothing you can do to affect that stock price. Real estate, you can affect it. Like if you buy a house, you put value into it. You can actually, you can increase its value regardless. Like the market could go down 10%, whatever market you're in. You could buy a house in that market. The market could go down 10%, but you could have created 20% of value. And you don't have to spend a million dollars to create value. You can, you can paint the house. You can put in new hinges and door handles. You can maybe knock down a wall that is an unnecessary wall and like open up the floor plan or something. Like you can be a value add investor and you can affect the outcome of your investment. So if you're gonna buy, you should look for properties that you can add value to regardless sure. and not have to worry about, oh, home prices do this, home prices do that. Like screw home prices, like you've got this, roll up your sleeves, you're gonna create value. So, so, so you think the time is always gonna buy, so don't try and time the market. But I'm mm -hmm. curious, so a 30 year, let's just say a 30 year second home loan, what rates are we seeing today for that? 30 year second home loan, you're in the high sevens right now on a 30 year fixed. We with have some arm products down. with 10% down. 
We have if you go to product. like 20% down, what are you seeing? Is it a little bit you're lower the, on the rate? No. For the 30-year fixtures, you're really the same. Okay. Um, yeah, you're basically the same one, right? Maybe a quarter lower or something like that, but it's not super significant. And then so, on the ARM products, which can you explain what an ARM is for those who don't know? Sure. An ARM is simply a loan where the interest rate is not permanently fixed. You, there's a five-year ARM, seven-year ARMs, 10-year ARMs. We even have a 15-year ARM. All ARMs typically, and with us at least, all ARMs are amortized over 30 years, just like a 30-year fix. Yeah. But a seven-year ARM is six for the first seven years. After seven years, it becomes an adjustable rate. And what does it adjust to? It would basically adjust to the current market at that time. So, and there's always a cap, like for on, on ours, there's going to be a 5% lifetime cap. So if you get in at seven, it can never go up any higher than 12. Than 12. Okay. And they, can, what? And they can go down just as easily as they can go up. And what would they shift to after seven years? Like, would they go from seven to, can they go from seven to 12 and then stay at 12 forever? In the first year, they could increase their entire cap, which would be that 5%. Potentially, but it, but again, it's just going to go to the current, whatever the current market is. So mm-hmm. if that is 12 and, or if it's 14, it's going to go to 12. It's going to, and that I'm assuming is based off like the fed funds rate. Well, there's, the, it's actually right now based off of the LIBOR the SOFR. The so, LIBOR has gone away. It's the SOFR it's called. And so it becomes a six month adjustable after the seven years or the 10 years or the 15 years, whatever arm where it's you. fixed for those first seven or. 12 or 15 years. And then once it becomes adjustable, it can adjust one time every six months. And what is that current rate you're seeing? Let's say a seven year, seven year arm. What for that first seven years, what does it look like? So a lot of different uh, things that impact it. So whether it's jumbo or non-jumbo, the rates with ours at least are uh, cheaper. If it's jumbo, we have better rates for new construction. So it's a little difficult. I mean, I don't want to put out like an exact quote because it can range really from the sixes all the way to the high sevens, depending on various factors, but depending on someone's situation, it might be to their best interest to take the arm over the 30 year fixed products. And we just kind of look at that on an individual case by case basis and determine what's best for that client at that time. Got it. So you really have a personalized approach to each client. So for what I want to get into, what I'm curious about personally, and something I've never done, which I feel like I have experience in a lot of the different, a lot of different things, but I don't have is new build. What's that look like? Like, like for me, let's just say, let's just say I had an additional, I don't know, like 15,000 or 10, let's just say 10,000 bucks of like DT I could work with additionally. What could I do from like a new construction standpoint? How does that work? Well, it's not too much different than buying pre buying a pre-build process is a little different. The mortgage side of it is not necessarily that much different. As far as building experience, I have no building experience. So I'm doing this one with a partner. My partner is a Chicago developer. So I'm kind of the silent partner. We're in at 50, 50, but he's running the show. So I'm not, this is the first house that I've ever built too. So I'm, I'm learning for sure. As I go, there's a lot of advantages to building. The cost of the land and the cost of the build on this particular project will be about 2.5 million. That's what we'll be into it for. And uh, right now, it, it would be worth about 4.2. So there's obviously we're walking into a ton of equity if that bears out. And, um, and what, what did you sure. have to put down? So on the, let's just say, let's break it apart. So when you were identifying the land, how did you finance the land itself? How did you finance the construction? Do you roll the two together or are they like separate pieces? Well, so we did it all at once, and that's one way you can do it, where you purchase the land and you get the construction loan all at the same time. If you have your like plans and specs in place already, then that's something you can do in order to have, in order to get the construction loan, you need to actually have all the plans and specs. Otherwise you would buy the lot first, 20% down on a lot loan. That's pretty much an industry standard. The lot was 850 or so, 860. 20% down on that, and then 10% down on the construction loan, typically, depending on the loan size, can be more than that if it's into the jumbo territory. But the equity from the lot loan is applied to, right? So like if you put 200 grand down on your lot, 
when you when it comes time to do the construction loan, that's two hundred thousand in equity that you have already going into the uh, construction loan transaction. Got it. So let's say in your example, you bought the land was let's just call it a million. So you put two hundred k down, and then the building cost is going to be like one point six. About one point five. 1.5, which means you'd be all in two and a half million. You would need 500K down to, to fund that. So then you would have to raise it or you'd have to invest an additional 300K in cash to now fund this $2.5 million all in project. About right. Yeah. Got it. So you're going to put, if you put 500, and this is where it's crazy, if it actually comes out worth 4.2 million, now that 2.5 million is going to go to 4.2. So you're going to have $1.7 million of equity so of equity in the property on an initial cash investment of five hundred thousand. correct that's what we're hoping Jeez. for wow so and we might even str on this one is even up in the air i mean if it's still worth 4.2 in 18 months when it's built we might just sell it right but if the, market does, <laughs> if the market does yeah if the market does cool and it's worth 3.5 or and I, I doubt it would go down that much but say it did then we're not in a hurry well happily turned into an str until the values are back up over four million i mean that's one thing about real estate values you can be afraid they're going to go down and they will go down at some point there will be a cycle we'll hit it at some point again where there'll be a nice dip 10 percent or 15 maybe even 20 percent. it'll happen at some point but it always goes back up i mean there's never been a time in history where they went down and they didn't go back up even in 2008 look at how far values crashed in 2008 and by Five or six years later, they were back, or maybe six or seven, seven or eight years later, they were back to where they were. And now they're double what they were. Yeah. So, and, and what I say is that when people are like, oh, is real estate going to crash? Like the prices are too high, yada. It's just like, well, are there really that many homes being built? It's really, it's a game of supply and demand, essentially. And it's hard to build a home. And I, well, you have now have more experience than I do. Is it hard to build a home? I mean, you're working with a home builder, so I think that's a slight advantage you have there. But it's difficult, yeah. the zonings and the permits. Places make it very challenging to build. You're building a nice thing. You're building a multi-million dollar house, which a lot of times developer cities want nice houses. As much as everybody acts like they want affordable housing and politicians say what they need to say to get elected, it is hard to, to build affordable housing it's hard. Yeah. That piece of land you're on, you couldn't, you probably, if you wanted to put like a 10 unit apartment complex where you did rent for a thousand bucks a month, I'm sure they would have, yeah. they would have, they would have laughed at you. I mean, they would have said yeah. to the city that they would have said to like the locals, like, oh, we're trying to do affordable housing. But then they would be like, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> don't actually please yeah. build a really nice, ex big, expensive house that that's cost millions of dollars. Yeah. Not a lot of affordable housing on Marco Island at the moment, but yeah. Got it. So you're building a, okay. So your goal with this house is potentially flip it. <clears throat> the thing that I think that's cool about building is like, I'm very, people say, oh, what's like a good market? Oh, Marco Island's a great market. It's a terrible market. Mm -hmm. X market is amazing. Like for me, a lot of times it's like the right property. I mean, obviously having good like market fundamentals is important. You don't want to see that a market has like five times as many short-term rentals as it did three years ago. And in order to like do really well, the ones that are crushing it are just like multi-million dollar properties with heated all the amenities they need, the heated pools, the hot tubs, the basketball courts. Like I'm going to stay away from that personally, but as long as like I can be in a market and I can have like, it's not ultra competitive and I know that I'm going to have a very competitive property, but a lot of times that means like the right property and being able to build like from ground, that gives you a huge advantage because you can just you can customize the home to have high potential as a short-term rent. Is that something you're doing is you're trying to make it like a very attractive short-term rental or you're just trying to build like the nicest home possible? I think we're just, uh, we're not as focused on that yet. We're just trying to build a really nice home. So, and like I said, I'm along for the ride kind of on this deal. So we're really just following the professional's lead. We want to make sure that it isn't just done perfectly as an SDR, but if we do sell it, obviously we're good chance. We're going to be selling it to somebody as a primary more likely than we would be selling it to somebody 
got it. That would, short, that would short term rent it at that price point anyway. Mm-hmm. So, It'd be uh, a very wealthy person from yeah from New York who, or Boston or what or Chicago yeah. or yeah. Canada or something who wants a second home in Florida. Sure, or primary, or Florida. primary. Sure, moving there. True. Okay, because I it gets my head spinning. I'm like, what? It, I think about like what floor plans do I love for short term rentals? I'm like, if it's a five yeah. bedroom house. I want that basement to be like the bunk area with the game room. Like I'm just imagining what I would to the space, which yeah, yeah. honestly now just based off this conversation, I want to do a new build. I want to, I think, you know, how it goes. You sparked my interest. Not that you've tried to at all, but dang, that might be the next, that might be the next domain. The new build. Maybe. Yeah. I need a builder. Anyone listening to this who builds, let me know. Ask me in six months or so. We haven't even started. We haven't even broken ground yet, but we're getting close. Yeah, you haven't even broken ground yet. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, so you're financing and you've done construction loans, land loans for investors in that in that in the past. Oh yeah, yeah. And you can build a second home. It's really the same terms, down payment wise, and that as it is on a pre-built. So you wow. can do a ten percent down. You can do a ten percent. You're gonna pay a little more for the lot. Like I said, twenty percent down on the lot loan. <laughs> But unless you go over a million dollars on the second part on the construction loan, you can still do 10% down on a second home construction loan. And you can, so for a primary construction loan, can you do 5%? No, three now? it's 10. Yeah, it's 10. Got it. I was about to say, because then you could, I mean, you could in, intend to live there and then you finish construction two and a half years later. <laughs> That's at that true. point. Yeah. At yeah. that point, you got kids to feed. You got <laughs> Yeah, a lot can happen. That's for sure. Two and a half years, you can, yeah. <laughs> that's a world to me. That's a world. That's 10% of my life right there. That's a world away. Okay. Very cool. So what would you say to the new investors you're talking to who, you know, maybe they haven't, maybe they didn't buy in 2020 and they didn't buy in 2021. I know you said real estate always goes up, but I guess, is there a particular type of property or place or any like things you can see where investors are having success? Well, I, I can speak a lot to my personal experience on it. I think it's very valuable to spend a little time in your properties. So we, we, like I mentioned earlier, I, we stay in all of our properties at least a little bit. So even if it is less of a personal use thing for you, and it's more of a straight business, I find a lot of value in at least being in our properties once or twice a year to live in it and feel it and experience the good of it and the bad of it that the runners go through. I have yet to decide whether I like single family homes better than condos, but I think I like single family homes better than condos. I think HOAs are not always the funnest things to deal with. And plus condos is actually something that's becoming very difficult to lend on in this space. Condos in resort type of areas, which is where you buy second home properties, buy a beach or in in vacation like areas and condo lending is getting very difficult. So that's another reason maybe. Is there a so, reason so for that? I'm just curious. Is the yeah. unpack, unpack well, that for us. Yeah, pretty much all of the condos in a resort style area are going to be deemed non-warrantable, which means you can't get a conventional loan on them. You cannot get a Fannie Mae or a Freddie Mac backed loan. But then even lenders who can lend from their portfolio where they're not lending fa- based off of Fannie or Freddie rules, they still don't really like them in their portfolio either just because of the transient nature of, of the developments. So a lot of lenders are just not even lending on condos in resort style communities. So you need to find a special type of lending. And then whenever you find a special type of lending, you pay for it with the terms, right? So the more creative something is, or there's implied risk from the, on the lender side, you're going to pay for it, the consumer with the terms, interest rate, down payment. A lot of these condos, you're not able to do the 10% down the second home loan. You're putting down 20%. And you're also getting less favorable terms as far as fees and interest rate. So single families are a lot easier to finance right now than condos. And this is really, all this change is really happening in the last couple of years. Got it. So that, I mean, that's one change. Also the, uh, the second home loan for a few years there, second home loan mm-hmm. and a primary were like at the same interest rate. And then were. about a year ago, they unhinged them or they unpegged them. I think that was their official terminology <laughs> and pushed it a little bit closer to an invest or pushed it closer to an investment loan. But yeah. Is that's one of the changes you've seen too? 
that's this is, so basically what they did was they were aligned with, as far as interest rates were concerned, they were exactly aligned with primary residences at the time. There was a little bit more of a down payment requirement for a second home. It was 10% down. Whereas, of course, conventionally you could do three and a half or three percent or five percent. There's programs for both, uh, but interest rates they were priced the same. Now, while you can put down less money on a second home loan, ten percent, the pricing is the same as an investment property now. So they used to align with primary on interest rate, and now they align with investment property. Got it. Okay, but the down payment requirement is less. That's the main. That's the it's main advantage. Yeah. Advantage. Got it. Okay, so. I was listening, buying a home versus a condo, it's going to be easier to get financing. So you can do second home loans for short-term rentals, only have to put 10% down. Yeah. What are other, some other tangible things that you want to share from your A, being an investor yourself, B, being a financier for other investors? Do you mean like as far as from the STR side or the just like lending tips? Anything. Yeah. STR, financing, investing. Real estate, give us the Brian Bockholt keys to success in life Gee. too. <laughs> life as well, family. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Man, I don't know. That's a tough one. I caught me off guard with that one. I don't know. I just, you got to be, you got to kind of be all in it, especially now. I mean, you know, there was a time not that long ago, very recently, where it was very difficult to fail in this. Almost <laughs> impossible. You bought something, you threw it up, you took some pictures with your cell phone. You threw it up on Airbnb or Verbo and uh, you made money, right? And it's still an incredible investment opportunity. It's still an incredible business. And I'm more passionate about it now, even though it's far more difficult than it was a year ago or two years ago. I'm more, far more passionate about it now than I was in the beginning. And I even believe in it much more now than I did in the beginning. And even though, it, even though in the beginning it was like printing free money, you just have to do a good job now. You've got to be in that top third. You have to, uh, you just got to outshine the competition, but it's not that difficult because I mean, here on Marco Island, a lot of my competition is still taking pictures with their cell phones. They're mm -hmm. still not putting any real, they're not monetizing their units. They're not putting in any of the nice new amenities that you see, the, wh whatever it is, whether it's arcade games or a, a nice coffee station or what, whatever, a lot of people are still not doing that. So you can't set it and forget it anymore. You've got to be hands-on. You've got to be checking your pricing. You've got to be doing research, but it's, uh, it's still an incredible business opportunity, investment opportunity, retirement plan, and also something to enjoy yourself throughout. Like I said, we do a lot of personal use. So it's been a, it's been a game changer for us as a family. I mean, I'm here, my kids are at one of our, at the house that we talked about. I'm here at the condo doing this with you. The kids are in the pool right now at the house waiting for me to get done so we can get the jet skis in the water. So, what you know, for so many, <laughs> what a life. For so wow. many reasons, man, for so <laughs> many reasons, uh, it's been a game changer, game changer financially and from a family aspect and everything in between, it's been phenomenal. Got and, it. I, so for and I recommend it to, recommend it to everybody, to, to everybody and anybody as a lifestyle for sure. Got it. So, so for folk who are listening, who want to get started, want to buy their first house. Uh, they don't, maybe they don't know what their financing options are. Maybe they've talked to a lender who doesn't know what they're talking about and uh, how can they, how could they get in touch with you? Well, I'm happy to, they just reach out to me in any capacity, email or phone number, email or phone. I'm, and I'm happy to have a quick chat, 15 minutes, go over. You, you can pretty much get to the bottom of someone's situation, in a quick 10 or 15 minute phone call and we can probably figure out just about exactly where you're at and kind of how to take the next steps from there. And what is your email? At Hunting My email yep. is Brian, B-R-I-A-N dot M, like Michael, dot again, Bockholt, that's B like boy, O-C-K-H-O-L, D like David, T like Tom, at Huntington dot com. That's Huntington, like it sounds, H-U-N-T-I-N-G, T-O-N. Dot com. It's a long email. John, um, or you guys just can look up Brian Bockwold's Hunting Bank and he'll pop up. I'm there. And, I'm there. You can Google me. Yeah. And you guys definitely, if you want to know what your options are, and even like for folk who maybe for me, I couldn't get a loan a year ago, but I think, I think I talked to Brian about my situation and he set up, you need two years tax for like, this is what you need, two years mm -hmm. tax returns, 
et cetera, et cetera. So for folk who this is a long game, you want to put yourself in the position today for to maybe get a loan next year, we get a loan the year after real estate. Sure. Brian's been doing it for 30 years. That's a 30 year mortgage right there. So we're in this, we're in this for a good time, as you said, the lifestyle component, and we're in it for a long time. So you guys are in the right place, Brian. It's been such a pleasure having you today. Thank you so much for coming on. Hey man, it's been a pleasure being here and I really appreciate you having me on. Awesome. Thanks, Jeremy. All right, Brian, until next time. All uh, right, you bet. And guys, that's it for the Short-Term Rental Pro Podcast. Stay tuned for next week.